Good evening, Atlanta and everyone else. Thank you very much for tuning in if you're in Atlanta. I hope you are dry. I have my hoodie on in case the office floods. Nice storms. I'm glad everyone enjoyed them tremendously. I'm sure you did. Uh, tonight, uh, yeah, the Game Jam is coming up. Beginning of February, and I know there are a lot of locations in Georgia and elsewhere. We've always uh, been a big part of these. We're looking forward to another Best in Georgia competition. So again, the locations will in Georgia will all nominate one game to continue working, but get professional mentorship from members of the GGDA to help uh, work on it for another month. And then we'll vote on the one we think has the most commercial promise. We've done very well with the past. Light break out of Deve did a great Kickstarter. Moving forward, we'll have uh, some of their folks out at our next meeting Tuesday, Kennesaw State University Marietta in the Student Center, where we'll be doing Game Jam Best Practices. And we'll have folks from the Georgia Tech site, the KSU site. Hey, that's really cool. We're looking at Yumi already. Wow, I was trying to hide myself. And Daniel said, uh-uh, you're talking. We're going to show you front and center. So what a neat tool. All right, so uh, yeah, so tonight we are going to be demonstrating the Yumi uh, platform. I have done very little with it, but the folks at Yumi are making it available for folks taking part in the Game Jam for free. So I'll let Daniel talk about that later. So this conversation will be looking at Yumi, but we'll also be talking about collaboration in general, because it's a tool not just for game jams, but also for game dev, for game education, and for a lot more, as I'm sure we'll learn along the way. I'm going to let uh, our host, Daniel, introduce himself last. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and start up in the upper right-hand corner with our good friend, Jonathan Weinberger. Hey there. My name is Jonathan Weinberger. I'm the founder and CEO of Game Dev HQ, and we are a training organization um, that helps people break into careers in tech through gaming uh, and beyond gaming content using Unity. So thanks for uh, having me. Appreciate it. Great having you back. And he is, of course, back in Atlanta. No, he's not. We know you're yeah, all jet yeah, setting. Yeah. I was, yeah, yeah. You know, I was in Atlanta today, but no. Headquartered in Hawaii, um, temporarily in Orlando. So if you want to learn Unity in Hawaii or anywhere else, talk to Jonathan. All right, Ron. The man who needs an uh, introduction. Introduce yourself. Um, hey, guys. Uh, my name is Ron Jones. I'm a indie developer myself. Uh, big fan of Unity. Um, since I learned it in school back in the day. Um, I started an organization called the Indie Cluster that works as a platform of, uh, of services that supports indie developers uh, and help them grow their business, finish their game. Uh, we offer services like QA testing, social media um, management, and all that good stuff. And uh, my day job is a QA tester, I'm trying to Dress that up a little bit, but it's just a QA tester <laughs> at uh, Tripwire Interactive. Without QA, we all fail miserably. Exactly, exactly. Rick, we'll jump you ahead of Daniel. Terrific. Hey, hey, everybody. We had him in a GGDA stream before. So welcome, Rick. Thank you for having me, Andrew. My name is Rick Morgan. I'm the founder of Curiosity Voyage, a new startup designed to help connect people with their passions and and put them in the careers that they're looking to get into things like what Jonathan Weinberger is promoting through Game Dev HQ and lots more to come. And I'm really, really thankful to be here with y'all today. Thank you. All right, Daniel, the man of the hour, we're going to turn it over to you. By the way, folks, we have had storms here. We had electricity out at GGDA headquarters, giant skyscraper building. Uh, we don't expect any more issues, but if it goes out, I hope Daniel is uh, recording this. And we will post the VOD. In any case, the VOD will be up. But Daniel, tell us about yourself, what you're doing with Yumi, and then we'll get into the whole conversation about collaboration. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, good to be here. Uh, first time caller. And so my my background, my roots go back to Maya 1.0. I was part of the dev team. Um, so I've been helping companies put pixels on screen for ooh, 25 years. Uh, about five or six years ago, started... Um, teaching kids how to design video games. And uh, we had about 10,000 kids running around, you know, in Vancouver, Canada, uh, teachers running around teaching them. Really, kids as young as six were learning how to build games in Unity, which was pretty awesome. But then COVID hit, which totally sucked for teaching kids in person. Um, so we ended up building a platform uh, 
really designed for kids originally uh, where they could collaborate, right? And so they could see what everybody else was doing because that was so, so important in being in a classroom. Um, and because everyone was working from home, we couldn't control their equipment. So we even built cloud infrastructure. So everyone got Unity streamed from the cloud into their browsers. Uh, fast forward, you know, t last year, we kind of launched this platform for really for adults, professionals and businesses um, with that same idea where it's really when you're online, collaboration is about seeing everything at the same time, right? So you can look around at what people are working on, ask questions in context. And, you know, the tools that we have right now for, for working online are their presentation tools. You know, they, they were really designed for one person to broadcast a PowerPoint to a whole bunch of employees around the world. Um, and they're awesome at that, but they really are not great at the kind of stuff that we do with creatives, right? It's like, I need to look at the code, but I need to show you the engine too, or I need to pull up Blender so we can really have a conversation about everything. Um, and so that kind of collaboration is, is what we're all about, is share as much stuff as you can in one space um, and give you any technology you need to... Um, to really work and learn together. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, so we are talking about collaboration. So one of the things I like about Yumi is that the Yumi team uh, found weaknesses in existing collaboration tools like you already talked about, being able to access uh, the code and the engine all at once. Um, the beauty of Unity, being able to go straight on in and play around with everything uh, right there. So, Daniel, let's start with you. Let's get you talking a little bit more about some of the problems you saw in other collaboration tools and then we'll go ahead and feed into the panel to get some of their thoughts on what does make for good collaboration and how these tools can facilitate that yeah um you know when when we were working with kids in education the a really hard thing to do when you're online is ask questions right because when you're in a group and you've got like a presenter at the front and you're saying oh i'm having a problem i can't figure this thing out you try and explain it in words and they would try and explain back to you in words. And eventually you might say, okay, fine, share your screen, right? And then the whole room has to watch your problem, you know? And, and most people sort of, they clam up, right? They don't, the majority of people don't want to let people know that they're having an issue. Even though as, as an instructor, right? And anyone in education, you know, that's, that's the teaching moment, right? You'd want to know that someone's having a problem so that because probably 10 other people are and they're just too embarrassed to ask the question. Um, so, you know, that was that was really core to what pushed us to say, you know, it, it just it can't be done effectively um, with what we were doing, you know, with, with the Zooms and the Teams and all that kind of stuff. It, it just didn't work. Um, so, you know, solving that problem was was really, really key. And, and it opened up everything for us that once once we solved that, we're just, oh, my goodness, this this solves what, you know, everybody else is challenged with too. So, you know, like in our platform, sharing your screen, obviously that's that's really important, but it, it's having access to other things as well. So, you know, for example, I could bring in, um, I'm gonna bring in a video and, you know, we can all watch this video. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna just Let me know when you're ready. Priority. Yeah, so, you know, this video is going to play back pretty quietly. So go ahead, Andrew, and, and, and hit play. And, um, you know, what you're seeing here is an instructor's viewpoint of the classroom, right? So they're, they're able to see everybody's desktops, right, streamed into their browser. And it changes the conversation because you might give a little bit of instruction. Hey, here's how you do one or two things. And then you send everybody off to go and try it. And typically, you know, um, in your webinar it's a really good way of kind type, of yourself you know, and just presentations, you're just like, hey, does anyone have any questions? No one asks a single question. And you sit and you just wait for one to pop up. But when you can see what everyone's doing, you understand if if people are having problems, right? If they, they haven't even opened the file yet or they're stuck on a loading screen or you're identifying those issues before they can even ask the question. And so you get a really good sense of, you know, where is everybody at and, and you know, how quickly I should progress my curriculum. Very nice, Riker. By bringing the video into the conversation, I know we're all looking at it, right? I didn't put a link in a chat that sent you off to another web page and who knows what, you know, who's doing what. All the resources that I need for this event that we're holding today, I have available to me um, in my resources tab, which is at the top of the screen. So I'm going to pull in another um, example of a game jam. 
and we'll set that one as the priority. And now you can see, you know, in this video, oh my this is my like, you know, it's four people hanging out, making games in Unity. Oh, uh, if you listen to that conversation, it's just fluid, right? They're talking about what they're seeing on screen. They're, oh, let me check it out. And I can just jump over and look at someone, what else someone else is doing. So I put in the umbrella like last minute, so it's still not raked up yet. But so we're in the, the sun is up here. So we're in planting phase and we drop these guys down. So, you know, this kind of interaction is what we're all about. And, and that's kind of the focus of our, you know, that, that's our mission. I didn't get any there because I didn't have any mature plants yet. So I have to plant them like crazy here. Daniel, you're getting quiet, quiet on me. Nope. I was just going to mention, just to let people know, um, Andrew, I guess, is playing the video, but it's not showing on my, I guess, client. I also, um, so I'm watching it manually hit play. Right. Oh, okay. So I, I have manually hit play as well. Okay. Yeah. I would just figure that was a, a nice little feature, right? Just because you put put the um, the the video in, you know, not it's not going to play for everybody, basically. Well, you so can do that by just sharing impressive. the screen with it playing, or you can let everyone else click it on their own time. That's amazing. Yeah. So nice it, it allows this cool. asynchronous part of the meeting, right? Where I, I've added some content that we're going to be talking about. And now I've kind of just said, hey, you know what? Play it whenever you want. We can still chat without me having to like take over your focus. And, and I think that's a lot of what, especially we learned that from kids, right? They're, they always need a distraction while they're focused. Yeah, like it's this that. new phenomenon. I mean, if you're a parent, you've seen it with iPads and all that. It's a huge change, but but you need that ability to like, I'm I am paying attention to you, but I need to keep my, you know, something flashy over here. So, in that way, this platform lets you do that, right? It's not always in sync. It doesn't have to be. Hey Daniel, what's the uh, what's the max capacity of you know we work with high schools for example that where we run game development programs for them? How many students can you fit in one of these rooms? Yeah, so you can get. I mean, technically you can get fifty. It's not that's not where it shines, right? It really shines as you get closer to fifteen and ten. That's when the collaboration part. That's when people will actually speak and exchange ideas without that kind of like, hang on, I'm going to turn off my microphone and my camera and I'm going to sit back until it's my turn, right? The the smaller, when that group starts to get a little less than 15, the collaboration and the, and the conversation really, you know, stays at a high level and you get a lot of value out of it. Um, so yeah, but we, we do have teachers in high schools teaching Unity through this uh, platform for a couple of reasons. One, for the you know, the interaction, um, but also for the technology. Uh, and I'll show you a bit of that in a minute. For those of you who see me looking to the left, that's where I'm answering chat questions. Uh, so uh, feel free to ask any questions you may have there. And uh, yes, so Charlie, as I just mentioned, the, the info here and the info on our Tuesday meeting will be relevant no matter what Game Jam site you are at. So, oh, oh got to click on the board. Cool. So I've just brought in a whiteboard, right? And all of you guys who are in the meeting, just hit see the board and you'll join me in here. Uh, if you kind of zoom out with your middle mouse button, I'm in the, I don't know, we could start in like the online training section, right? M Miro is Miro.com, great whiteboarding tool. They've got free accounts. If you're doing game jams, I think it's an amazing place to get your team to center around a whiteboard like this where everybody can add sticky notes and you can sort of really quickly get ideas put down and kind of structure you know the space into a bit of a project management tool that stays flexible right because you know talking about the, the game jam that's coming up you've got 48 hours you don't have time to load up trello boards and like have a really rigid project management system um in, in my opinion i think because things change so quickly you might throw out an idea after six hours right and then your trello boards not worth anything um, so using a whiteboard can be a really good way to have the flexibility to put ideas put reference images and artwork and all that kind of stuff and always refer back to it um, but just to ask you guys like you know you've been working on on line and, and remotely for a while what are some of the collaboration tools you're using yeah i can go ahead jonathan sorry oh no okay yeah go ahead. i mean rick you, you probably know all of our stuff well, Primarily, Google Hangouts is a big thing that we use, um, especially actually with schools, like Google Classroom and things like that. 
um, just because it's an approved software. Yeah. Um, and then Zoom, of course, for, for meetings. Yeah, and I was going to say, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where somebody's brought up like Microsoft Draw or something to draw an explanation or uh, draw.io is one that I see a lot in project management meetings. Um, and this is awesome, Daniel, because like you've got everything in one place for all the stuff that I normally am clicking around multiple windows to try and put together and then share screens. And then, you know, that's always an issue. This is awesome. Yeah. And, and you know, it's a persistent space too, right? So unlike a hangout, you know, you get in there and it's kind of, there, there's no record of anything that was done. When you add YouTube links, when you hook up your board, you come back to this meeting link tomorrow or next week with your team, it's right here. So you're not always having to like reset up that space, whether it's a training space or just like a collaboration space with a group that, you know, maybe you meet once a week to just jam on some ideas. You come back in here and it's all there. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I just yesterday was using Canvas with the contractor, which was nice, but definitely limiting for actual interaction for actual collaboration it's one of those things where you're using the tool and you're on the phone <laughs> saying do that do this yeah in order to make that work um it's not going to take the place of github uh i use uh, discord for quite a bit of collaboration i can see a lot of places where this is a big advantage over discord yeah i mean we're purpose built for this right we were designed from the beginning for these kinds of things and and we're getting customer feedback to further specialize in this space right where discord is awesome but it came from i want to chat while i'm playing video games and everything else has been an add-on uh, so for them to specialize in collaboration is it's not really their core uh, necessarily yeah i was going to say discord is probably um uh outside of my day job but discord is probably um um, and then where we really use like Slack and um, uh, Hangouts or Google Google Meet um, for like quick calls and jumping on the calendar and stuff like that. But um, I actually started experimenting with Jamboard, Google's Jamboard uh, last year. Um, so that this reminds me, uh, or this feature reminds me of that a little bit. So, and that's always a good, you know, having a whiteboard where everybody can see and draw collaboratively. So. Yeah, I remember probably, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, whiteboarding was like the nouveau kind of thing to do in corporate world, right? You'd, you'd bring in an expert to teach you how to use a whiteboard and, and brainstorm. And mm -hmm. now it's just like, I think everybody's doing it. Like, I haven't gone to my accountant's office to see if they have a whiteboard, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe they'll be the last industry to whiteboard their problems. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's really just a tool that I think, whether it's Jamboard or whatever you use, uh, it's a great one to have for, you know, anything that's creative, right? Where you want to understand ideas, where you want to quickly prioritize, you just move some of these stickies around and you've got this visual space and hierarchy that just evolves with the people who are in it, you know? So it's, it's very malleable. And it's funny, I've been at software places, not as a game place, but they still have the giant physical whiteboard wall where one wall is just a whiteboard and you still see them ink from a decade ago because everybody is now using online whiteboard tools. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I, I hear these CEOs talking about like, listen, I, I need my staff to come in two days a week. I need them to come in four days a week. We're not as efficient as we used to be. And I believe, you know, I've always worked remotely. Like I, back in 99, I designed the Mystique transformation for X-Men from home, you know, and sending shots off to, you know, studio in, in Hollywood. So I've always been a believer that you can work well from home. Uh, but that said, like, I think you, you can see that as a CEO of a company, you know, when people are all in the same space, there's this thing about, you know, I, you're walking by someone's cubicle and you can see what they're working on on their screen. Right. And, and, you know, if and then you can walk over to them and say, hey, that's cool. What are you doing? Or, you know what? I think I just heard in a meeting that that thing's getting canceled or there's this synchronization between people when you're in, a, in the office that you're always everyone's getting resynchronized, you know, 10, 15 times a day. So you get some efficiency out of that and you get this collaboration and communication that happens outside of a formal meeting. And when everyone's working from home, 
you really have to work hard to synchronize with your team. It's like, do I want to get on another call? Do I, do I want to check in? I'm just going to put my headphones on and build my character for the next four days, and then I'll submit it for review. It's like, well, maybe you made a problem that could have been fixed on day one if someone just walked by your desk, right? So I can appreciate all the challenges that you know CEOs are having and wanting to have those moments happen again, but I think it's just a lack of technology that you know the, the what we're using at home hasn't matured enough to replace it. Daniel, as long as you have the whiteboard up, let's talk just a little bit more about whiteboarding and how to use it effectively. Because I think for a lot of jammers, especially college kids, they've done some of this probably more physically than digitally. So how would you recommend they use it? Yeah, I mean, I like to think what we do with what we started off with kids scales really well. Um, and if you come over to the, to the sort of right side of the board where I am, I'm under design a game. And, you know, when, when it comes to a game jam, right, the first thing you need some alignment on things with your group and how, how can you get there really quickly? So when you do your brainstorming, you just start off with like, what are the goals of my game? Okay, well, let's go to the goals section and everybody's just start throwing down sticky notes, right? The goal of my game is to score points, to collect coins, to get to the next level, whatever it is. Everyone can throw it on, throw their stickies down, and then you can spend, you know, you time box things. So like we'll spend 10 minutes ideating on the goal. We'll spend five minutes talking about it. And, you know, you can take, I don't know, let's, let's just say um, my goal is to slay dragons, right? We might say, hey, that's the one that we're going with, and we'll just take everybody else's idea and put it on the side. No harm, no foul. Let's just vote and we'll move forward to the next thing. So we have a game about slaying dragons. What are the obstacles, right? And you go through that process. And what's nice with the sticky notes is like nobody's idea is thrown in the trash. It still exists there. And maybe it comes back, you know, between the obstacles and then you've got the rules and the progression of the game. Um, if you can sort of lay it out with sticky notes, that's a great starting point for your team. And, and you can start to branch off and like people can go into, you know, go into Google images and start grabbing reference images and paste them in here, grab gameplay that you, you know, that you liked, you know, that you were talking about as a team and add the YouTube videos. And, and you have this place where you're all just on the same page. And, I'm gonna, you're probably gonna hear me see same page a lot today because I really think that's what it's all about, what collaboration is. It's, it's as much as you can avoiding trying to explain something and have someone argue back that they don't understand or their viewpoint and you realize Shh, we're not even talking about the same thing. And we spent half an hour banging our heads against the wall when there is no conflict, right? Like, Well, I'm gonna show you a great example of that thing? conflict right now. Because I think collaboration is not about being on the same page. It's about creating a much bigger and better page than either of you would have come up with or all of you would have come up with uh, on your own. So it's about creating a bigger page and then making sure everyone understands it before you start poking holes in it. Yeah. See conflict, everyone. It works. <laughs> Andrew's always thinking outside the box. <laughs> conflict can, can't, conflict is healthy. It is part of, you know, geez, if you're going to, if you're going to be up for 48 hours, work on something you're going to argue you know and, and, uh, you, you hope that it's come it's out to benefit. tuesday's meeting to see how to make that constructive arguments and not uh, destructive ones that's tuesday yeah. at ksu and marietta student center all right anything else you want to show us about whiteboards anyone else have comments about whiteboards and collab i think i think that's it anyone want to want to chime in on anything before i move on yeah, I mean, this is this is really neat. One of the things I, I love about this is the thing where you mentioned where each of these rooms is an instance. I'm actually thinking how like this is really powerful for you know I, it's not uncommon where people are working on like a dozen different collaboration games or in our situation like we have planning meetings all over the place and being able to come back to a dedicated room for this thing and, and re catch up on everything um, that I like. That's something I wish uh, Google you know it's kind of like using Google Docs and Google Hangouts and this kind of simplifies that approach. So it's pretty, really, really cool. Cool. Yeah, I mean, we're not trying to replace those. Those are great tools on their own, but they're, you got to bring all the tools together, right? Yeah, so yeah. I mean, we spend a lot of time recatching up on meetings of like what we covered last time versus having an instance like this where it's like, hey, we were playing around on this, like everyone's getting refreshed pretty quickly. Yeah. Cool. 
All right, I'm going to show you some other stuff. Let's. We're going to go solo for a second. Um, so, and then I'm going to invite you all in to do this too. I know this is. We're, we're going to talk Unity, so we will open up some Unity as a group. This is Unreal Engine 5.1 running in the cloud, streaming into the browser. Right. I'm in the West Coast. I'm getting 60 FPS. You guys are probably getting, depending on your internet connection and, and the weather, you know, you're probably getting 30 or 50 um, FPS. If one of you uh, wants to take control of this computer, just move your mouse over my screen and you'll see a toolbar drop down. And there's three dots. If you click the three dots, you'll see request control. All right, Jonathan, you're in control. You can also um, use that toolbar. There's a magnifying glass, so you can make that that bigger as well on your screen. So now you're running Unreal in the cloud, and all of us can point out stuff to you, like, oh, you've never used Unreal? Well, here's the, uh, here's the play button to play your game, right? And so you can see me annotating over your shoulder and telling you what to do. WASD, spacebar, go grab your gun and shoot some stuff. Yeah, I mean, this, this is insanely cool, although I, I, let's see, it's not letting me move around. So uh, click not. once on, on with the mouse and then WASD, or you're on a Mac, so it might be funny with the keys. <laughs> it's angry with me, but yeah, I, I, I Mac. Uh, uh, who else? Rick, you want to, or Ron, you want to grab control? Um, sure. So, Very cool, though the annotation process on that. I mean, that, that's that's super cool. Um, I don't. I actually don't. I mean, Zoom has something that's terrible where I can like try and underline something for you, but being able to actually physically see your mouse movements, that's cool. See, one of the issues I have with Zoom, I mean, it has its uses definitely. It's a pain to live stream, and one thing I have really learned in game dev, I like live streaming the game dev and the play tests. So part of why we're doing this is for me to test how it works with a stream. So John, Daniel and I had some issues putting it together and the like, but it's doing much better than I'd be doing with Zoom. There we go. I think you, uh, you just hit the pause button. Ron, if you want to grab it again, you can grab control of this computer. Oh, I, I paused my pause it. Oh, uh, I think Jonathan geez. had hit the uh, pause button. That's why it wasn't All right. uh, button. Kill that blue screen of death. All right, now you're in there. There you go. Uh, <laughs> hey, Daniel, uh, what iteration uh, is this? What version of release? I don't know how long you've been doing this, but I mean. Oh. We, we've been up and running for the past year. Um, okay. We've kind of, we've started pretty small groups and just gone bigger and bigger in terms of number of customers. So um, yeah, I mean, in terms of what iteration, every day it's iterating. Right. Every week we get some customer feedback that's like, yeah, that would be better. And then we push out a new release. So, you know, by streaming stuff through the browser, it means that anybody who has access to a browser can now run any hardware. So suddenly Unreal and learning Unreal or unlearning Unity and, you know, some of the more advanced features, you're not limited by the computer that you have under your desk. Right, which opens it up to you know brings a lot of equity into um, into our space, our industry. Which traditionally, you know, you've had these huge barriers of you know I want to be an animator. Great, you need three thousand dollars to explore your interests. Um, that's not easy for a lot of people to to try and experiment with, right? All right, so this is pretty cool. Let's all jump into the training zone. So we've got a room right now. We're in the lobby. Uh, at the bottom of that list, you see the training zone. Oh, I'm trying to. I'm going to let uh, you all go into the training zone first, and goes. I'll join you because I go. It's going to shift focus on the stream. Okay. So click on the training zone and join the room. All right, Andrew. Wait, so these are like uh, like who who has breakout rooms? Zoom has breakout. Zoom rooms. has breakout rooms. Google. Someone has breakout rooms. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Daniel, we can't hear you. Or can you? Hear me? I can hear him. I can hear him. There you go. Ooh, okay. I think my audio setting. Uh, 
Can you maybe you just want to come back in the room. You want to go out and come back in, Jonathan? Go back into lobby and then come back into the training zone. So for the rest of you, if you look at the top of the screen, you see there's this tab at the top right called All VWs. If you click on that, you're going to see everybody's workstation. So Andrew's got a workstation. Your workstations are all launching. right? So everybody in this conversation is getting a machine spun up in the cloud for them. Uh, I'm going to, let's see, because you guys are all Unity experts, right? Um, huh. <laughs> is that I'm, the word? Well, experts. That's what I hear. OK, so I. Honestly, I haven't used a lot of Unity lately. But if you see my screen, um, you know, I've got this character up, whatever. Um, enter to start, so I can run around you know, and play that game. And same thing, right? You guys can all take control. So while your machines are turning on, you know, that game will get launched on top of each of your systems automatically because this is a training environment. So we can all be watching what everyone's working on, and we can give a hand and point stuff out. So it'll take a couple minutes for that, uh, for so those tasks to get the machines it's up. The, it's still, you're the only one running the game, right? And we're just saying, hey, click this, or we're not doing it for you. That's right. So if you wanted to show me how to do something, just click with your mouse, drag on my screen, and I'll, I'll see you know, what you're pointing at. Yeah. Yeah, so Andrew's moving around his. You know, as an instructor in a training environment, I'm aware of where everybody is at. I can let the other students know, like, hey, your machines are coming on. Just have some patience, right? It's booting up. Um, I've got some other stuff on my machine, too. I've got, you know, we've got Blender open here. Anyone know Blender? Ron, you're the artist. <laughs> yeah, so you know you can grab hold of Blender. Yeah. Um, every technology you need could be launched on a machine in the cloud, right, mm. with full access to it. Yeah, that's cool. Well, that's next level, Daniel. That's amazing. Thanks, Jonathan. Did we get you back yet? We can't hear you. Oh, you can no, hear us. Hear we're halfway there. I'm um, trying to just go into the there Hey, we're hearing you. It's a miracle. Excellent. And I really think we'd be taxing the system a lot more than we are, Daniel. That's, that is impressive. That's really cool. So who, who owns this virtual instance? Uh, is, is Yumi spawning this up or? Yeah, so we, you know, as a customer, the you can customize your own instance however you want. Um, it lives under Yumi, and we manage turning it on and turning it off. You know, so that I think a lot of challenges with the cloud, um, and the cost in working in the cloud is that just in time access to things. Right, when you have computers that are sitting idle for thirty days and you only use it for four hours a month, you're paying for the storage or you're paying some little fee and you know when someone spins up a classroom when that classroom is done you want those machines turned off you want to have your billing stop um, so we manage all of that kind of stuff for you and, and take out the complexity of it and then of course you know you can decide do you want a machine with four gpus and you know a terabyte of memory sometimes you might you know but and and if you do you get it and if you know, when you're done with it, it goes away. Yeah. Interesting. Is there a is there a, I mean, a pricing model for like a you know, using this all the time? Or I mean, what I looked at initially seemed like it was made for you know meetings, but but you could go way beyond that with this if you wanted to. It seems like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there's definitely so you know if you think about the two parts, right? There's like a platform where you can share everything. Um, you don't need virtual workstations, right? You can share your stuff on your desktop. You can share not only one window, but you can share five different windows on your desktop separately, 
So you know what it's like when you're kind of like on a 4K screen and right. I've got, wind, I've got Unity and I've got this other application. I have to share my whole desktop, right? You don't with us. You don't have to. You can pick all the different pieces and and bring them in. Um, and so you know, if people have the hardware at home, great. Come join and and share your screens. And for the people who need it, they can just jump into a room and and get that hardware access that they need. Let's see if machines should be up. Yeah, it looks like everybody's machine is up. Um, so if you go to your, if you click at the top of the screen, you've got virtual workstation. That's just yours. Um, so you can click on that tab and you can say continue and it's gonna keep loading this, uh, this character um, game level. Well, as that's happening, Lana on YouTube was talking about how she loves how everything's brought forward with the, with the meeting. Now it, continues to live and how you can track it more easily with good feedback she was talking about older experiences with whiteboard whiteboards so again if anyone has comments or questions in the chat feel free to ask them and we will get them answered or commented upon yeah so let's see how you y'all are doing so your levels are starting to load cool okay so it, when you go to that all virtual workstations tab, you can, can you see, see exactly all of our virtual workstations. Sorry, say again. He's asking if you can it's... see all the virtual workstation. Yeah, in that. Oh, weird. Yeah. Did I uh, audio cut out? You're in. You're back. No, I think you you might be delayed a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the top of the screen, there's a tab called all VWs, and and then you can see everybody's. I think um, I can see everybody. I feel like I'm, I guess mine's just in load. I got an, I look like I got an error. What did your uh, error say? Sorry, you too. You see it? Oh, Buntu crashed for you. Well, so go ahead and, and click don't send. Um, that's another thing. My cursor is a little. Yeah, I can definitely see this is like valuable for, you know, student engagement, being able to, to see where everyone's at, because you're right, like, like we, we have it where we're in classrooms and these kids, like, don't want to talk, they have their cameras off, they don't, like, half of them don't even share their screen. Um, that's nice. Yeah. So in this, I guess in this, um, the training zone, could you opt out of sharing your screen? Yeah, if, if you're sharing your own desktop, you can always, you're in control of what you're sharing or not. If it's the workstations in the cloud, you can't opt out, but you can limit it so only the instructor can see them, not everybody else. Gotcha. Yeah, there's, you know, going back to like when we started with kids, we had to put a ton of privacy controls, right? Like, mm -hmm. man, some of the things I saw teaching kids when we when we had cameras and like, Everyone was at home and during COVID, right? So, okay, you know, dad's walking by in his underwear. <laughs> Kids on a laptop in parents' bed with dad's bare, hairy chest. You're like, yeah, no, no sense of like filter or so we we're like, all right, we gotta lock this down, right? What was the bare minimum? Bare minimum, we needed their voice, but no video. And, and so in doing so, we put all these levels of controls that you can have as to, you know, how you manage who sees what. I can so top that story, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I should in this setting, but <laughs> um, it's only a live stream safe forever on a VOD. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, go to the lobby with me, Rick. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, and I can't I hate to keep going back to pricing. We can talk about that on a sidebar if you want to, but I'm trying to envision how this would work so would the educator control all the licenses and then the you know the the other users that may what we're going to call students maybe or that are logging in are they able to piggyback on the educator's license or do they have to have individual license how does that work yeah i mean the educator is in control of the computer so you know for something like unity you can have obviously every student can get a a, a unity account so when unity spins up and it says hey who are you you know, yeah, you log in um, 
and that's how you get your Unity access, right? Uh, in the case of like some software that runs off of a license server, you would configure that computer in the cloud to point to that license server so everybody whose machine boots up grabs a license from it. Uh, it seems like almost everybody is now subscription based and you know log in with your account and you're all set up. Right on. Yeah. So you've talked um, anyone want to take control of my screen and come over to the conversation tab and if you want to take control of my screen and and just mess around in unity you can do that so same thing just the three dots and then request control which of you is doing it before i do all right is Andrew going to do it? Yeah, all right. all right. Andrew's going to control Unity. Go for it. All right, there you go. All right, and you can treat me as a newbie because I have not played around with most recent Unity. Every, and you reconfigure stuff very differently from how I used it in the day. Yeah, this is pretty. So I'll, pretty just play, uh, I'll just play. There you go. So go ahead. Yeah, like you, you know, We can drive them. We can say, tell them what to do and point stuff out all right well let's do that then we go ahead and uh pause the game and let's see all right so blow it up a little bit yep yeah, use the plus to resize and uh i don't know let's maybe go double click on uh this gold coin over here there you go and if you use control d should duplicate it Okay, so you can see over here on the hierarchy, you've got another one, and then just grab the controls to move it somewhere else. Start populating your scene with gold coins. Excellent. I'm getting rich. That went inside of it when I would control D that time. So, Ron, you know, coins. something that we've seen a couple of game studios um, looking at doing, which is QA. Uh -huh. Right. And like when you have games, sometimes with the multiplayer games, being able to see everybody from the squad at the same time. Yeah. Right. And and just having that game producer or the QA person kind of watching and recording all of those people playing at the same time. Yeah. You know, and yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, it, it's I mean, I guess I guess when it comes to that, you know, definitely. um I guess probably maybe the frame rate or just like yeah, I don't really see too many too many restrictions that would like hinder that that process because I mean a lot of what we do the the reason why documentation needs to be like incredibly uh, like precise and and well organized and whatnot is because oftentimes communication breaks down and people aren't in the same time zones and there needs to be a record of stuff you know but having some kind of tool where a lot of that can happen in real time, you know, that, that kind of nips that in the bud for, yeah, for a lot of, a lot of reasons, or, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just that, you know, um, that UX experience, right. Which is like, Hey, how do you customize a character? And you watch four people do it and you realize like, man, people are not understanding, yeah <laughs> you know what's going on but when you watch a group of people it's a very different experience um and and a conversation around it right than than when it's all everything is one-on-one -on -one. it's like wow we can go through four opinions in the same time that it would take me to get one opinion um and one set of feedback yeah yeah i mean it's crazy it's a little hard to get to get my mind kind of wrapped around the the like the robustness of what you uh created here and like you know um some of the uh edge cases that might help out or or just opportunities to uh, kind of minimize um misunderstandings and whatnot yeah um, really sorry we didn't bring oh, all the artists in because i'd love to see this as a collaborative art tool go ahead ron i'm sorry no no you good i was just uh, i think i was about to ask another question yeah so i think i asked a little bit or you touched on it a little bit earlier but so these are all instances of what is the actual project right so if everybody hits save what 
would actually like get saved. This is everyone's got their own copy. Um, in this case, right in, the, in this training world, everyone got their own copy of the project, put on the machines. It launched when they exit this event. It's going to archive it, and tomorrow when they come back, they're going to get their work continued. That's training, right? Versus production. So production example would be there's a Perforce server, and everyone's machine, you know, launched in the cloud, connected to the Perforce server, sync the project down. You did your work, you sync it back, and you know it, it lives in Perforce. Gotcha. So that, that process still needs to be synced up. Um, I, could, I guess I, just, I could just see myself like getting confused and making sure, trying to make sure that I actually saved what I thought I was working on. Um, uh, and when you bring up like a, a version control, I know that's a whole kind of a whole, not even a separate industry, but just like a whole specific topic that especially small teams have different tools for and uh, can be an issue if the project uh, persists, you know? Yeah. So yeah. And we, we kind of take this one, you know, we're not, because of cost, we're not proposing that people work in, a, in the cloud five mm -hmm. days a week. It's too expensive. Um, as, as the cloud is right now, it is too expensive to be in it 40 hours a week. You know, after four or five weeks, you might as well have just bought a computer. Um, right. Very different than training, right? Or um, we see like some studios using a cloud computer for dailies and, and reviews, right? So you get this machine in the cloud that is streaming to everybody real time. So we're all in sync looking at the same thing. We can all touch it in real time, right? It, mm -hmm. it gets rid of all of those the lag issues and the, the synchronization issues um, works really well for that. The other thing of like, yeah, every day, if you want to come in here, it's expensive. You know, let's be honest. The cloud is the cloud is, is designed to be an on-demand system and, and persistence in the cloud is, is not its sweet spot. Um, you know, that mm -hmm. said, it's a computer, right? It, and we treat it in an ephemeral way. So you just imagine, right? The hardware is all there. You stick in a hard drive that's got your company's configuration on it of certain software and servers. You use it, and then it just disappears. So syncing your data onto it and off of it is just an exercise that you would do like with anything else. You know, I'm done my work today. I sync to my server. All right. Yeah. OK, so, so you wouldn't be, uh, or so you wouldn't just be um, offering or selling the software and the, um, the package you would like part of that is the data that the, these projects take up um there yeah if if we're managing lots of data for you there yeah there's some fee in that okay. but uh you know going back to that's where cloud is really good because data is cheap in the cloud um, so when in a training environment right where people are working on very specific lesson files it's really nice to have it all managed for you in the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone gets it. It shows up. It's loaded on the machine. It's offloaded and archived. Nobody's fumbling around with file naming paths and all the other stuff. Um, so on that side, that it works well when we manage data. But um, you know, I don't know. You know, for Jonathan, in your world, like maybe you have your own Perforce server that's a read only with all your lessons and that's just part of your curriculum is like sync up a perforce server point of view like having a lab like lab sessions where it is pre-template um and it's, it's something you just spin up every instance and it's like hey is your fresh lab we're doing this some of the things i've noticed that i'm cool. playing around with it is the frame rate and i don't know if it's because the internet in this hotel is spotty but that could be problems it's very there's clearly some latency and I don't know if it's for everyone or just me, but I imagine it's got to be for everyone, the, the latency uh, between cloud and, and our personal stuff. Yeah, so latency is is purely a function of your internet speed. Um, obviously, a hotel is going to have some stuff that you're going through. So depending on where you are and, and what your, what your, um, your distance is, right, to to the nearest region like we will spin up machines in the closest region to you but your latency to get there is going to be limited so in a hotel with wi-fi 
you're probably in the 40 and 60 milliseconds, which is going to bring it down um, to whatever that is, 15, 16 frames per second. Um, but for most of us, you know, working from home, uh, you're probably in the 10 and 12 milliseconds, which is going to get you 60. So it absolutely is, though. It, it's 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 a function of your internet connection. So sort of going back to accessibility, you know, for someone who doesn't have, a, you know, a high performance computer, does that mean that you shouldn't be able to access and learn these technologies? If your frame rate isn't high enough, but you, and you still don't have a computer, you're limited, right? So when it comes to the virtual computers, it's, it's about giving people access and the best possible access that they can get, right? Short of, of giving them a physical device. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been very interesting seeing the, the specs that we get out of our students uh, in some of our programs that are just sort of run across North America and like certain parts of the US they have horrible internet and in Canada too, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, we know it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a problem, um, in certain regions, certain cities, uh, that it puts people at a major disadvantage. Like I right, plug for Georgia. Who, I was at a meeting today where we announced $280 million for rural broadband. Sorry, I had to do that. Go ahead. <laughs> no, and, and that, that's part of it, right? It, it is getting, the government has to put that money in because it means that people suddenly have access to things that they couldn't have accessed before, right? So in, in Canada, we've got, obviously we're, you know, large landmass, very few people, not a heck of a lot of infrastructure between these great distances. Um, but Starlink suddenly means that we're able to have students joining us from really remote locations in Canada and actually building and designing video games and getting their hands on technology. Uh, yeah. All right, we've got eight minutes left. Um, and we've had a number of folks talking about the jam in chat. So let's go ahead and focus on if you're a jammer, how are you going to use this tool? So the best thing about it is um, it's all browser, right? Whoever's running it can do it out of browser. Is that correct, Daniel? It's all in the browser. Um, so nothing to install, which is great. Uh, I think if you're a jammer, you are probably have Unity already running, you know, on your desktop, and so you're going to use a screen sharing feature. You're not going to be using computers in the cloud uh, as a jammer, and and I think that's going to be the biggest difference. Is you're going to have this place where you can all come in. Your coder is going to be coding. You're going to be, you know, and, and you can stay live in this space for you know the entirety of your game jam if you need to and quickly ask questions and see exactly who's working on what you know and, and being able to check that out i think that's going to be the, the biggest advantage and then you know of course use a whiteboarding tool however you, whatever you use um, whichever tool you got to integrate that so one thing that we recommend with jammers is after you have formed your team and you get together You've got the theme for the game jam. You're going to spend your first few minutes, and really your first hour, just brainstorming ideas for what you want to do. One of the rules we always say is take those first five great ideas you've had and throw them out because everybody else in the building has had the exact same five great ideas. And then you keep going. So whiteboarding, voice, all are excellent for that. For getting those ideas going, throwing them out, and breaking them down to what you want. The other part is what Daniel was talking about earlier, was get on the same page with it. So uh, on that whiteboard or elsewhere, you have listed what everyone's tasks are and what they are creating first, what they are doing right off the bat. So you've got a good sense of what you're doing. Everyone knows that one of the issues I have with jams, you don't have time to do a Gantt chart. Almost well, nobody does Gantt charts at jams. I'm going to have a Gantt jam someday, but uh, not today. So it is a great way for tracking tasks. And uh, all of you, well, Ron, I know you've been involved in task tracking for folks before. Jonathan, I figure you have too. Any suggestions mm -hmm. on that, how to get a new team working quick to keep themselves on task and keeping their tasks coordinated? So we've always used for our game jam Trello boards, but I could see how Mir can come in and kind of replace that. You know, you can set up your, your to do, your, your done, your testing. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's, 
definitely from collaboration point of view. Um, idea tracking, Trello is great, and and Mirror is, is really get, it's getting popular. We we actually use Mirror for education planning, so it's it's a cool tool. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna mention Trello and and um, even what uh, uh, Jonathan had asked earlier as far as recording or onboarding somebody that was that's new to the project. I think that um, has an interesting or this would be an interesting uh, tool for that. And just basically like everything that we ever did in the timeline, like here you go and kind of you get to kind of view it or, or see it almost in real time. Um, so. Yeah, well, it's all synchronization, right? We're all. The easy other thing. Docs, right? So like everyone's starting Google Docs for game ideas, everyone's grabbing inspirational art, the ability to just throw things into this resource folder and have it stick there. Um, that's definitely, uh, definitely convenient. And in the jam, there's no limit on this thing up for 48 hours. Again, Yumi is providing this to jammers for free. So you can have a window sitting open with this for 48 hours. And there's frankly awesome. no, no reason not to. Yeah. You know, keep it. I mean, you don't have to have it for 48 hours. You know, I got to still feed my family, but um, <laughs> no, I think, you know, the, the most important thing for us and, and why we're, you know, why we're offering this up is we want to understand how people use it, right? We, we've used it our way. We've used it with people of different ages and different industries. The more we know how people are collaborating, the more we can improve this tool. Um, we'll see which features get used and how often, right? And, and we'll understand how we can help people with their collaboration. Like we've even, we've, we have this AI research project going on right now to understand what does it look like when people collaborate? What kind of stuff do they share? How do they move through their data? Um, that's, as we're pulling in, you know, and understanding that data, that helps us inform what is the interface that we need to put together um, mm. to make collaboration, you know, just really flow, you know, Dang. flow through all of those resources. Daniel and Ron, you're going to love this last question. Charlie Denton on YouTube. How long is too long to spend debugging a central mechanic? So in a game jam, you don't have much time. The, a lot of it depends how big the bug is. If it's crash bug, you'll spend a lot more mm -hmm. time than if it's just not working correctly. Uh, but I think that's a great question, Charlie, but I'd also like to talk in terms of bug hunting in using this tool for bug hunting because we have the screen sharing and the ability to give someone else control of your screen. So why don't we talk about that a little bit, Ron, quick minute on QA in general, and then Daniel will wrap up by talking about using this for QA. Um, yeah, what I, I guess what I uh, kind of touched on a little bit as far as being able to see things in real time and kind of you don't necessarily, or can kind of bypass the need for documentation in some instances. Um, but I think one, one feature that we kind of use and, and helps keep us going as far as like on a larger in a larger team like tripwire is like email and notifications and whatnot when people kind of change the status of a ticket uh maybe from something being open to being looked at to being verified um I, besides that i mean that, i think that and the, everything that like trello kind of um can provide and stuff like that is really the uh what what big teams would, would love the tool and then the notification of uh when things are progressing and daniel I how mean, do you recommend we've talked, we've talked about that my partner because we, we used to work at ea so you know we know the big game team side of things as well and you know when you when you get that ticket and it's linked to a certain build being able to just you know hit the button fire it up and like here here's a here's a live session we can all just come in and let's try it Right, you reproduce it. I'm right here, and 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 have all the stuff just pre-populated. Um, that would be super awesome. Uh, I think you know the question on on how long do you spend debugging a central mechanic? Again, short period of time. Go back to the board and like, where's the sticky note that said why we're making this mechanic in the first place, and can we get away with not doing it? How core is it? What do we need to drop in order to to solve it? Um, yeah, great point. Game jams often lead to meatball games, spaghetti code, but that's as it's going to be. So make sure it works well enough in the jam for what you need to do or find something that will. 
and then move yeah. on. I mean, your your game might be the game, you know, the best one because it has this one mechanic that is just new and super fun. Like, okay, Flappy Birds, right? Like, very simple example of how a most the most basic uh, mechanic just made a huge hit. So. There's no really right or wrong answer other than how quickly can you triage the importance of that thing uh, with your teammates. And never be afraid to make a, a game in a jam that's just one mechanic. But um, all right, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to wrap up. I'm going to get everyone to, again, issue some cells and uh, give one plug and we'll end with Daniel. So Rick, let's start with you. We're going to sure, find yeah. more about Curiosity Voyage. Go to curiosity.voyage. You can learn about the program that we are offering right now for Jonathan Weinberger's Game Dev HQ and more to come. So join our newsletter and you'll get updated. We're your connection for that career that you're passionate about. Uh, Jonathan, we've lost his audio again. His, it catches up in a second. Oh, Wait, wait for it. Oh, didn't catch up. Nope, nope. Sorry, Jonathan. Everyone go to Game Dev Weird HQ. Point it to anyone who needs to learn Unity. Ron, what are you talking about the Indie Cluster? I feel all the charisma, but sadly we can't hear him. Um, so IndieCluster.com, uh, for those that are making a game, want to join the family, the support group, whatnot, um, want to do a quick plug for our Twitch channel, uh, twitch.tv slash IndieClusterATL. Um, for that, we do a couple shows, um, Monday night play tests where we offer free QA and, uh, uh, dive in Wednesdays with wonder J where we play release indie titles and we are offering, uh, QA services for anybody that wants to make a game, wants to grow the game, or just needs some professional QA to look at it. And James Simpson. Oh my gosh. Didn't even see you sneak in. Sorry, James I would have loved your comments yet. on the Unity part. I really wanted you to play around with Unity within their engine and talk about it. Anyway, plug what Cellblock or Dr. Unity are up to. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Yeah. Okay. So what was the statement? Apparently, when you turn on your mic, your speaker sound goes down, at least at least on a mobile device. So what was the question, Andrew? Uh, what is Cellblock or uh, Dr. Unity up to? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Unity is always busy, but I'm always there to help out other people. I'm helping a studio out in South Carolina right now, build some amazing educational games, and I'm working for some, I'm doing some other stuff on the side. We have a lot of council ports that we're moving over to right now, and in general, we're, you know, we're always looking to help people out. So if you have any Unity questions, feel free to ask. I currently also work with Jonathan uh, as a mentor on his Game Dev HQ, and he's got some incredible talent coming out of there. And he's got a good, solid program, and I'm really happy to see where it's going. And I can't wait to see all these, all these, uh, all these engineers start building their success and their dreams. Yeah, really sorry I didn't get you to play around with their with Unity within the Yumi uh, platform. That would have been. I'd love to add your comments on it. All right, and Daniel, if you want to go ahead and close this out, talk about how folks can get in touch with Yumi and especially utilize it for the game jam. Yeah, really simple. Ume.studio. Um, head over there, request access. Uh, just let me know that you're coming over from the GDA, GGDA, and I will help get you set up for the game jam. Happy to have you. Give me whatever feedback our team is is always looking to hear. Um, the good, but the bad is what actually makes us better. So, all right, share that's that. awesome. Would that's you awesome. be open to people streaming while they use it? Quick Absolutely. Question. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. There, there's nothing here is under wraps. So share, broadcast, tell your friends, tell your family. We're uh, we're here for you. And as always, we like to leave with viewer comments. So we'll leave with Lana's, which is woohoo. So. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to all thanks, of you man. thanks especially to you daniel for showing this off confusing it we'll be following up and this will be up on our youtube channel all right say well, good night everyone oh good night, good night everyone. everyone i guess